the module on confounding and bias, this is the lecture segment for information bias. So again, there's a lot of different terms that you might hear about the way data are collected in a study of diagnostic suspicion bias, surveillance bias, classification bias, recall bias. Um, but I would just group all these together and call them information bias. So again, we had selection bias, which is who are the participants in your study about whom you have data. Information bias, you have those participants, what data do you have? What is the quality of those variables that you have measured about those study participants? So we say that information bias is the result of measurement error or misclassification. So I'm just going to parenthetically mention that measurement to me as an epidemiologist is any piece of data for the study, whether it's the answer to an interview question, a lab assay result, a disease diagnosis. We're just measuring all this stuff. We're, we're trying to capture this information. We say that we're measuring it. OK. And then misclassification is often measurement error in a categorical variable. We've, we've, classified, we've misclassified exposed as non-exposed. Um, and, and, and using those two categories, we talk about misclassification. So sources of measurement error. So imagine that there is the true value of some factor, whether it's exposure, disease, or confounder. There, there is a truth, OK? But then the truth is subject to random variation and biological variation. Um, so the classic example that people use is you know, blood pressure. People are walking around going through their day. Their blood pressure is changing you know, depending on their activities. They're, they come into the doctor's office and they're stressed. Their blood pressure changes. So that's still sort of random variation around the truth, right? That's biological variation and random variation. And then but the moment that you choose to measure it is really the best you can do, right? So there's a true value of that factor at the point that you're going to measure it. And, but that is affected by the performance of the instrument and the observer, how the re re results are recorded, how the results are computed. And that finally is going to end up give, providing for you the value of that variable used in the study. So, so random variation, statistically, you just have to account for that and be aware of it. But at the point that you're measuring it, the performance of instrument and the observer um, the, you know, the quality of your study design, the attention that you've paid to testing out your methods before you scale them up, all of that is also going to affect the quality of your data and the value of the variables you use in the study. So in epidemiology, we talk about both validity and reliability of a measurement. So it's actually possible um, for your, so, so, so the ideal is the upper left here. You want your method, your your measurements to be both valid and reliable. So if the bullseye is the truth, okay, the bullseye is the gold standard or the true biological value, if you have a way of measuring it where all of your measurements, so all those smaller dots are, you know, the shots are your attempts to measure this truth, if they're all circled right around the bullseye, that means, you know, the average value of all your measurements equals the truth. And it also means that any individual measure, measurement did not deviate very far from the truth. So that's both valid and reliable, and that's awesome. So at the upper right, you may have a measurement that is very reliable. So see all those shots are grouped very closely together. So when you repeat the measurement or do the, use the same measurement me method on different subjects, you're always getting, your, your measurement is reliable in terms of it being repeatable. All those shots are landing very close together. And that's actually a desirable characteristic. Even if, as shown in the upper right, all of the average of all those measurements is not actually hitting the bullseye, it's still hitting some, it's, it, they're still hitting the same spot reliably, so that if you use the same method across all of your study participants, you're going to expect your, the error to be, to be very similar. So we would call that actually a, a measurement with low validity, because it's not hitting the bullseye but high reliability, it's reproducible. So reproducibility is very desirable, even in a not perfectly valid measurement. Um, OK, and then on the lower left, we have a, a bunch of shots that do average around the bullseye, right? If you averaged out all those measurements, you would hit the bullseye. You'd be hitting the truth. So that is a valid measurement, high validity. But it's not very reliable, because your individual uses of that tool are going to give you a lot more variation than you would really like. OK, and to be completely avoided is the lower right, where you have a measurement that is neither valid, it does not average out to the bullseye, nor is it reliable. Repeated uses of the same measurement tool are giving you a variety of different results.
Okay, so in words, reliability is a method consistent. Does the same value result from repeated measurements over time, over observers, between different tests or instruments? And then validity, is the measurement correct or true? That is to say, does it agree with a gold standard measurement? So in research, we do have to accept that there will be some error. The question about measurement error becomes, is our causal inference, is our ability, the ability of our study to provide information to infer cause and effect compromised by this measurement error? So here's a classic example. It's, it's really kind of an old canard, um, but it's, it's used in, the, in one of the textbooks. So case control study, mothers of babies with birth defects and mothers of control infants infants are asked a few months post-birth about use of non-prescription drugs during pregnancy. So that's, that's A. And then B, for cohort studies, mothers are asked during month eight of pregnancy about use of non-prescription uh, non drugs during pregnancy. So just intuitively, which creates more concern for you about information bias, A or B? Asking the mothers after the birth after they know about a birth defect in their child about their use of non-prescription drugs, or asking all of the mothers before they know anything about an adverse, um, about a birth defect or adverse birth outcome about their use of drugs. So hopefully you're all thinking B, and your intuition is correct. Um, mothers could be wrong in month eight of pregnancy. Um, they could not remember correctly, they could not report correctly for whatever reasons, motivations they may have. But if none of those mothers knows about a, the birth defect outcome of their baby, at least the error for everyone in example B, the errors are going to be similar. The real problem, big problem would be introduced in A, where some mothers already know they have a baby with a birth defect and others have a healthy baby. And when you're asking them to recall things that happened during their pregnancy, the mothers of the baby with a birth defect may have been really stressing about it and, and may remember things differently. So, so this is kind of a classic example that it's used and apologies to, to, um, you know, to mothers who've just given birth. We don't want to undermine your, your credibility. But, um, but, this is, but this is sort of illustrates the concept that if you, you can have some error in a measurement, not all the mothers are going to, to, to remember in detail every non-prescription drug they've used. But if the error is different for the mothers who have the, out, the study outcome from the mothers who don't have the study outcome, that's where we really get concerned about information bias. So in a similar way to what we talked about for selection bias, if we are now overestimating um, a cell in our study in an unbalanced way, that again is going to bias the risk ratio. So if we have the mothers who have both disease and exposure status, um, if, if we are overestimating the mothers who have exposure status, because they are reporting themselves to be exposed when in fact they were not. So now this isn't, we aren't overestimating any of the, the numbers in these cells because we're picking the wrong study subjects, but we're just placing them in the wrong, in the wrong uh, cell by, due to information bias, mathematically similar effects. If we have unbiased, if we have unbalanced, if we have uh, error that is related to both axes, exposure and disease, we are going to have biased risk ratios and odds ratios. Whether comparisons are biased depends on the type of error, and we distinguish between differential measurement error and non-differential measurement error. So these are going to be some kind of wordy slides. So going back to the intuitive one, um, A, asking all the mothers in month eight, they could make some mistakes, but that would be non-differential measurement error. The measurement of exposure would not be related to the disease outcome. We could ask the mothers after the babies were born when they know whether they have a birth defect now that error may be differential because the mothers of the diseased babies may have been, their attitudes towards the study and towards what drugs they used during pregnancy may have been very much changed. So the non-differential would be error that occurs across diseased and non-diseased equally. Differential would be um, error that, it, that it affects one group more than the other. And that's going to, again, introduce quantitatively the problem of bias in our odds ratio or risk ratio. Okay. Misclassification of exposure status that is unrelated to disease status is non-differential. Misclassification of disease status that is unrelated to exposure status is non-differential. 
Differential misclassification is when your misclassification of exposure is related to disease or misclassification of disease is related to exposure. So both of those, differential or non-differential, introduce some bias into the measured risk ratio, but non-differential error usually biases the risk ratio towards the null, whereas differential error may bias the risk ratio in either direction. So when I say towards the null, um, this terminology, so if your true risk ratio, ironically, the true risk ratio is the one you haven't measured, but let's just imagine that it's there. The measured risk ratio, so if, you're, if, you, if the true risk ratio is 2, but what actually you measured based on your exposure measurement in your study, you had a risk ratio of 1.2, that could be described as biased towards the null, with 1 being the null for a risk ratio, right? So that would be biased towards the null. We might also say it's biased low. Um, if your true risk ratio is 0.5, but based on your error in measurement, what you've measured is actually 0.9, that is also biased towards the null, right? Closer you are to 1 is towards the null. And then if your true risk ratio is 2, and but what you measured gave you a, a risk ratio of 2.8, that would be biased away from the null. So a situation of differential measurement error could actually turn your true risk ratio of 2 into a 2.8 your non-differential measurement error might change your true risk ratio of 2 to a 1.2. So the idea of actually concluding that there's a really strong association, much stronger than is really there, and due to differential measurement error, is considered a, something we really want to protect against in our study design. Um, let's ask ourselves a thought question. Which type of study has the greatest potential for misclassification of the exposure or treatment of interest. The greatest potential. All of them have some, some potential for misclassification. You can assign someone to a treatment in a randomized trial, and they may um, actually not take all the pills or something. So there's potential for classification in the randomized trial. But um, hopefully, a, a well-conducted randomized trial is, is really on it, and people are actually getting the treatments they're assigned to. A cohort study. You're determining exposure status, hopefully at the time that it actually happened, right? You're, you're measuring data at baseline, following the, stu the participants forward. So, you, so their exposure status at baseline is what you're measuring at baseline. So some potential for misclassification there. But then a case control study, you're actually recruit, you're, um, you're selecting participants for your study after the outcome has happened. And you're trying to go back in time to figure out what the exposures or treatments were in the past. So for this one, I would say that the case control study has the greatest potential for misclassification of the exposure um, due to that time frame. Again, which type of study has the greatest potential for differential misclassification of exposures? So this is where case control studies are really losing out. Again, the example of mothers with the babies, we did that as a cohort study. There may be some error, but it should be equal because they don't know what their outcome is. In a case control study, they do know what their outcome is. Your study staff knows what their outcome is. Trying to get um, your variables equally measured for your cases and controls after the outcome has already happened means that case control studies have the most potential for differential misclassification of exposures. All right, so what about the study outcomes? Can those be misclassified? Yes, they can. And issues of differential and non-differential still apply. So in this case, the issue would be whether misclassification of the outcome is differential according to exposure status. Um, finally, there's the idea of misclassification of confounders. Most of our discussion of information bias is related to exposures and outcomes. But actually, if we need to control for a confounder or take into account a confounder in our analysis, we have to have a good measurement of the confounder. So if there's error in measurement of a confounder, can we predict the direction of bias that would result? And probably not. So even non-differential misclassification of a confounder can potentially lead to failing to control for the true confounding effect, and therefore reporting association when none exists, or bias away from the null. So in summary, for our whole um, lecture on bias and, and uncontrolled confounding, what I'm, what I'm encouraging you guys to think about is the, the possible types of, of bias in a study really can fall into three categories, uncontrolled confounding, selection bias, and information bias. And the key of, of controlling for confounding is to 
is to give a lot of thought in advance of collecting your data. Think about what the potential confounders could be. What are the things that are potentially associated with your outcome and associated with your exposure of interest? Collect those data, and then those can be taken into account to remove potential confounding. Information bias and selection bias are completely dependent on your study design. How are you going to recruit people into your, how are you going to design your study? How are you going to select participants? How are you going to select, um, how are you going to retain people in your study population to avoid selection bias? And then information bias, how are you going to collect those variables? So, so all of these things, um, for, you know, for the purposes of teaching epidemiology, we're not going into a lot of the quantitative aspects but we're really, I want you to really be thinking about these concepts so that when you go to conduct a study, when you go to design a study and plan data collection, you're, you, you want to be just very aware of you know, the potential for selection bias from dropouts in a cohort study, the, the potential for differential misclassification from, from the ways that you measure your variables. <music>